Epicureans are criticized for not, by Cicero, for not, essentially not having a moral theory. Right? They don't have, they don't put any importance on virtue. And certain things that uh, Epicurus says could be interpreted along those lines. For example, when he somewhere says, I spit on your virtues insofar as they produce no pleasure. Right? Uh, you know, moralists tend to take that as being a, an indication that he has no concern for morality and that he, he makes no uh, effort to incorporate morality or virtue into his system. On the other hand, Epicurus himself claims that one cannot live pleasantly and so achieve what he takes the highest good to be without also living wisely and justly, that is, without living morally, and furthermore, that it is impossible to live wisely and justly without living pleasantly. And so Epicurus claims, actually, Epicureanism is the only method to be a moral person, it is the only one that truly incorporates morality into its account of the highest good. But the reason people think that it um, isn't itself a moral theory is because he essentially takes the virtues not to be intrinsic goods that are valuable for their own sake, but instrumental goods that are valuable for the sake of his highest end, that is, pleasure. So let's just run down some of the virtues. Let's start with the big one, wisdom. Wisdom is valuable because its function is to comprehend the logic and physics necessary to alleviate our fears of the gods and death and so forth and show us the pathways to tranquility. Uh, it also, uh, wisdom gives us the means to distinguish between the desires that we really need to fulfill and those that it's okay to fulfill but you shouldn't work too hard to fulfill and those that you shouldn't um, come near with a 10-foot pole. Uh, it also teaches us the limits of pain and the limits of pleasure and to what extent the former should be avoided and the latter should be pursued. Um, and therefore, wisdom is not really pursued for its own sake, but for the sake of all of those advantages that it brings us. And one can't enjoy those advantages and thus enjoy the pleasant life unless one has exactly those forms of wisdom. Question? Yeah. So, if, if, if we fall for all the virtues, but all the moral ends are kind of instrumental, and so it would seem like the same thing goes for pleasure. Like you said, you, you don't just go into life with the patient because then it leads to pain afterwards, right? Because it's too. So, does that sort of seems to imply that even pleasure itself is instrumental to some other. Well, one, one could say that pleasure for Epicureans is instrumental for eudaimonia, or happiness, the highest end. Okay, that, that, you could probably say that without being inaccurate. It would probably be more accurate to say, however, that pleasure constitutes eudaimonia or <coughs> happiness. Okay, and so that what, what that is, what success, happiness, prosperity, and so forth is, is the enjoyment of pleasure. And so it's not really that pleasure is instrumental to that, it's that pleasure constitutes that thing when you have it. But you're quite right that the other things, these other things that, for example, the Stoics take to be intrinsic goods and good for their own sake and should be pursued for their own sake, they think are only instrumentally valuable for something, uh, something else. Uh, they think is instrumentally valuable, essentially, for pleasure. But again, remember that they have a, a on, on the one hand, <laughs> they have a simple idea about what constitutes the final end by calling it pleasure. On the other hand, when we unpack what they mean by pleasure, we see that that means <clears throat> aponia, or lack of distress in the body, and ataraxia, or lack of mental illnesses 
and disturbances in the mind. And so you can think of, in a way, um, pleasure being instrumental to relieving us from pains in the body and disturbances in the mind. Again, you could put it that way, that, the, the, that what we need to enjoy kinetic pleasures for, for example, the reason we need to get the pleasures from drinking or eating is to eliminate um, pains in the body or, or in the mind. And so in that way, it could be described as instrumental. But since, since they believe that, that we could virtually replace this talk of eudaimonia with just calling it pleasure, it, it, it probably makes more sense to talk of it as being a constitutive relationship instead of an instrumental one. Is, is it, when, when he says, oh, I'm mean, spitting on your virtues and so far as you need the pleasure, is it, is it like, is it ataraxia or is it hedone? Like? Hedone, uh, yeah. So um, what, what he's saying there is, a, as we'll see, there's moralists who will say, oh, you need to cultivate all these various virtues. You need, and, and not just the obvious ones like, justice and wisdom and temperance and courage, but you know, Aristotle has a list of 30 virtues, magnanimity and liberality and all these other things. And, and I'm, I'm sure you're, you're used to being having inflicted on you since grade school this idea that you all need to be excellent and you need to pursue excellence and so forth, right? And the Epicureans say all of that stuff is empty. All of that, those, you know, constant, um, protreptics and, and, and encouragements to cultivating virtue as if it's valuable in and of itself are wrong. There are virtues that are valuable for getting what is the highest end, freedom of, from pain in the body and disturbance in the mind. And insofar as they get us that, they're valuable. But insofar as you're telling me I need to be an excellent scholar and things like that and, and trumpeting all these highfalutin sounding moral things, I spit on those because they, they aren't actually connected with pleasure and they distract people from doing, cultivating the virtues they need in order to really get pleasure. So it does not mean I spit on wisdom, temperance, courage, and justice because I have a theory about how not only are those conducive to the highest good, but they are essential for the highest good. Nobody achieves the highest good without having those. Okay, yeah, so I have a common feature between those, those of the virtues he selects from Aristotle that are important and those that are empty and worthless and vain? Well, that's kind of a complicated issue because we don't know exactly how he reacts to Aristotle's moral theory or to what extent he may have engaged in these other putative virtues. And for any of them, you could probably make out a case how Epicureans could, as it were, co-opt them as they do with the other cardinal virtues that I've already named. And so there's a way that Epicureans will undoubtedly characterize themselves as being the most magnanimous and the most liberal and the most um, uh, and the, the most excellent and so forth. But, um, but what it really comes down to is that those things are in the service of this other end. And that's what really offends Cicero. Yeah. I remember you mentioned before how um Epicurus said that um, in order to live pleasantly, you need to live morally. Yeah. And Cicero criticized that by saying, well, then how come you have all these people who are really good, but they end up living terrible lives, and they end up having a lot of suffering? Um, it seems like Cicero was misrepresenting what and, he was. And you forgot the other powerful part of that argument. You have these people that oh, yes, lead, yes. lead really They're, bad lives, but they enjoy lots of pleasure. Right. It's, it seems like Cicero um, may have been putting what Epicurus says backwards. Epicurus didn't say that living morally will lead to pleasure. I think what he was saying, uh, by saying that to live pleasantly is to live morally, was that seeking pleasure leads to a moral life. Okay, you think that's what he said. I could see a problem with saying that. Um, most people would disagree that pursuing pleasure leads to a moral life. More, more people would be willing to accept the idea that pursuing a moral life would bring some kind of pleasure with it. But it seems easy to think how I can pursue pleasure without a moral life, or it seems easy to think about that from 
uh, the standpoint of common sense and Cicero and so forth. So, it, or, or Aristippus for that matter, right? So, sex, drugs, and rock and roll doesn't exactly create, you know, pursuing those things might give me a lot of pleasure, but they don't seem to give, give me wisdom, justice, temperance, and courage. Uh, I guess what the pleasures of Picarus was talking about weren't only physical pleasures. He was also talking about pleasures of the mind, like seeking philosophy and wisdom. Correct. So in that essence, it could lead to morals and things like that. Well, right. And so that's why these qualifications need to be made about, number one, what he means by pleasure, and number two, what he means by virtues. I mean, he's got a theory of virtues here. Um, it's not a theory that that other people share, but in a way he can go through each of the virtues and say that the person who's aiming at having the most pleasant life as we in enlightened hedonists, not Aristippan hedonists, but this enlightened form of hedonism where pleasure is identified with lack of disturbance in the mind and lack of pain in the body, if one pursues those things, then, um, then one will tend to live morally and, and really, it's, it's, it's the other way around, that, that um, one who chooses to live, uh, to, to, to live morally will end up getting pleasure along with it. And so I've already explained how that is with respect to wisdom, but it's pretty easy to see how it works for the other virtues as well. So temperance or self-control is one of the cardinal virtues. But again, it's not sought for its own sake, but because it brings us peace and tranquility. Recall the method of selection, which says that I ought to forego certain pleasures if foregoing those pleasures will um, bring greater pleasures later, or the more obvious way to put that is, will alleviate future pains. So yeah, heroin's great, but I ought to have self-control and not indulge in it because it will result in great pains later of addiction and dependence and risking overdose and getting um, diseases from unclean needles and destroying your organs and so forth. Uh, and similarly, it shows why we should endure certain pains, like going to the dentist and so forth, in order to uh, get certain pleasures later. Again, it's easiest to put that in terms of avoiding certain pains later. Yes, it hurts to have a dentist scrape my teeth with a sharp tool, but if the option is, is having to have a root canal later or having an abscess in my mouth or something, then I should be willing to undergo that. And so they define self-control or temperance as the wise employment of that method of uh, selection. Courage, what is courage? It's freedom from fear, and the greatest fears, almost all fears, descend from fears about death and pain, which are views about death and pain, which are based on our <laughs> natural science, um, manage to alleviate. Cowardice, the vice which is opposite of courage, is condemned because it leads to pain through fear. So we both show how to remove fear by means of our philosophy and thus how to be uh, courageous. Now, the most difficult one for the theory is justice, and the one that uh, Cicero spends the most amount of time harping on. But let's think about what the Epicurean view of justice is. First, there's a claim that being just always um, benefits you, but never harms you. That um, the opposite of justice, greed, unfairness, dishonesty, and so forth, all cause uh, distress and stress, which is painful. So unjust acts cause rumor, suspicion, judgment, punishment, and so forth. And even those who manage to escape detection and so aren't literally corporally punished, uh, they get plagued by their own consciences um, or their fears of eventually being discovered. 
and those fears are painful, and so in an effort to eliminate those fears, we ought to um, uh, uh, avoid doing things that are unjust. Also, the motives to injustice, the, to, to, to uh, committing an act that's unjust, for example, to get more than my fair share of something, our philosophy manages to eliminate the motivation for doing those unjust acts. You don't need more than your fair share because the things that you need in order to be happy are easy to get without injustices. I just need enough to drink and enough to eat and, um, and, and, and some modest uh, shelter and things like that. But those things are readily available. What motivates unjust crimes are people that think that they need wealth or they need uh, power and things like that, and we eliminate those motivations to action. Um, it's largely pursuit of empty desires that cause <coughs> injustice, according to the theory. Now, um, those, those are their accounts of the cardinal virtues. To that, after taking this question, I will discuss their views on friendship, which is the other most controversial aspect of the theory and the one which Cicero also spends a great deal of time talking about. Yes? Um, so, if it's a situation where you do something bad and um, you could get like a big corporal, like a big physical punishment, um, because they believe that mental pains are like greater than physical pains, would they say it's like more preferable to just go and take the physical punishment as opposed to like being unjust and not telling what you did and being paid by your own conscience? Uh, no, because they think that, that those mental pains and that conscious conscience and rumination about doing bad things and uh, do people think I'm a bad person, that all that stuff is really painful, probably way more painful than even the um, physical pain of corporal punishment. Although remember that Aristippus had an interesting position on this. He, he argued that bodily pains are more severe than mental pains, and as evidence for that is the fact that we punish criminals with corporal punishment. Um, uh, and because it's, because it's supposedly more severe. Um, so, uh, no, in general they would say you have both reasons to avoid doing, doing an injustice. Now, I thought what you were doing was trying to set up a counterexample where I had some reason motivated by pleasure to pursue an unjust act, and that reason would bring so much more pleasure that it would counteract the mere bodily pain of the corporal punishment that would result were I to be detected. And they take on that case specifically and try to argue that, that it would not, and that in fact it, it, it would cause greater mental um, anguish and pangs of conscience and so forth. 